go ahead and introduce uh, Howie here. So Howie Hua is an instructor at Fresno State where he teaches future math educators. Uh, in 2019, he was named Outstanding Lecturer for the College of Science and Math after only his third year teaching. He has a fantastic Twitter feed. You can see his, his Twitter here in the, in the, the title slide. He shares a, a wide variety of thoughtful posts on teaching and learning, some TikTok math videos. He's been into that lately. Uh, here you thought it was all trendy dances on TikTok, but no, Howie is there with lots of good math videos. And Howie on his Twitter feed shares many, many memes. Like, seriously, he's worth the follow just for the memes. So uh, without any further ado, let me uh, give the floor to Howie Hua. Thank you so much for being here, Howie. Thank you so much for the invitation, Dan. It really means a lot um, to be here. Um, can you type in the chat yes or no? Have you seen my memes before? For those that say no, you are in for a treat just because um, I'm sharing a couple of my favorite memes right now as an introduction. So um, like Dan said, my name is Howie Waugh. I teach math to future elementary school teachers at Fresno State. If you are on social media, uh, you can find my Twitter or TikTok at Howie underscore Waugh. I share all of my memes by category um, at HowieWaugh.com. So feel free to look at that um, if you want to share memes in your class. If you don't have social media, you could just email me at hhua at csufresno.edu. All right, so let's get started with some memes. My topic is honoring student thinking, but let's just spend a couple minutes looking at memes. So this is the first meme that I share with my students. Um, on the first day, it's a meme of my goal as a math teacher for those that, that do not like math yet. So the student says, get that thing out of my face. And then I ask students, where, which frame are you at in this picture? Are you frame one, two, three, or four? A lot of students say one, some say four. So I'm like, okay, if you're frame one, hopefully I can get you to frame two or three. Three is like the deciding part. Um, so yeah. And by the way, um, in the next couple minutes, feel free to put some LOLs or that crying laughing emoji face in the chat um, if, if it's warranted, by the way. And this is another meme that I share with my students. I ask students, where are they in this picture? Are they the cat in the box of memorizing formulas? Or are you in the play area where it's a universe of math exploration? Students would say like they're in the other room or still in the box. And I bring these back at the end of the semester as well, asking them, hey, where are you at? And some people say they're on the first step or they're at least out of the box, things like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is it Natalia? Thank you so much. This is my most uh, famous one, um, just factoring. You could do this for partial fraction decomposition as well. Um, I just thought that it was funny. Uh, this one personally made me laugh. Um, the 10 haunting photos taken moments before disaster. <laughs> And um, if you are on Twitter, basically the only math topic that ever trends is PEMDAS. So um, I think that PEMDAS is the least exciting thing about math, to be honest. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorites. This is brilliant, but I like this. So your final answer is brilliant, but the beauty of math is found in your thought process. <laughs> Um, I wanted to bring back an old meme template, so um, that's never going anywhere, and then you realize that it goes to infinity. <clears throat> and another factoring one. I just thought that this meme template was cute. <clears throat> and um, some word problem. Uh, memes. So I'm going to the store to buy watermelons. Only one or two, right? And it's never one or two. It's like 46 watermelons. <clears throat> um, and informational one, exponents. What did you do to me? And logarithms. I took away your bending. <clears throat> so logarithms just make exponents into straight lines. Thank you, I live off of the laughs, by the way. So thank you so much for those that are laughing. 
uh, teaching 160 students versus grading 160 tests. I really don't mind teaching as many students, um, but it's just the grading that just gets in the way. <laughs> and another meme template I really like, um, same, same thing, but with Tom and Jerry. I just really like his face on the right. <laughs> And for some reason on social media, whenever you just replace, um, whenever you replace uh, X, Y's and Z's variables with emojis, it's a lot more interesting and people want to do them. Um, now some wholesome ones, uh, complimentary angles, you inspire me and you're doing a great job. And this actually made my students laugh. Um, I started memes of the day in virtual classes just because they can hide with like just the laughing emoji face and all of that. Um, but I was really hesitant to share my memes in person because if it's just met with no one laughing and just like packing up and all of that, like that, that would just not be good. But students actually laughed at this one. I think it's one of their favorites where students, or when the teacher gives a three question quiz, but it's actually 12 questions. And some wholesome ones. I think that this can be a poster. Uh, what do you think your mathematical ability is versus the rest of your mathematical ability? Dan says I've given that quiz. Yep. And I actually had a dream about this one where if I Google image searched uh, math person, then this was the first thing that came up, but it, it's not there. So I decided to just uh, make it. Great. So, so I share a meme of the day at the end of all of my classes, just so we can end with a laugh. And at the end of the day, at the end of the semester, I told students like, hey, feel free to make a meme of me or the class. I won't get offended. Feel free to like roast me or whatever. But actually, they were actually really nice. Um, they were so wholesome. So this was one of them. Can someone unmute and tell me how to set up the first problem and then the whole class? <laughs> but yeah, that, that's so, I really like this one. And then some, they actually had a whole bunch of wholesome ones. So Howie, by the end of the semester, you will have a better appreciation and outlook on math, me at the beginning of the semester and me at the end of the semester. And then this one almost made me cry. So me, how are we at the beginning of the semester? You will be a math person. And then me now. So, so yeah, so um, if you ask students, um, they might surprise you with a lot of wholesome ones. Um, I didn't expect this much. I thought that they would just like roast me or whatever, but, but yeah. All right, so enough about this. Um, my talk is about honoring student thinking. So first, Thank you so much for being here. It really means a lot that you are here today. You could have been anywhere else, but you decided to be here. And I'm very grateful that you did that. And I hope that you get what you need in this session. So why are you here? You could type it in the chat or you could just think about it yourself. So I'm not expecting any um, anything in the chat if you don't want to. You could just do it by yourself. Thank you, Amy. And no, really, why are you here? I think that the last thing that we should all do as people are is to just live life through just going through the motions and not really questioning why we are at a certain place. So it really means a lot that you chose to be here as you could have been anywhere else, like I said. So thank you so much for being here. And um, I actually said this at a session once, like an in-person session. And then after this slide, a couple minutes later, someone left. And that's totally okay. I really appreciate that because they're thinking, hmm, well, maybe I don't need to be here right now. Maybe I need to be somewhere else. And that is totally okay, right? It's selfish of me to think that I'm the most important thing that's happening in your life right now. So who am I? Before we talk about honoring student thinking, I love the music and the arts. I've played piano since first grade. The clarinet since third grade was in the Fresno State Marching Band for four years. I love music and the arts. Love gymnastics. I can basically say anything about any competition 2003 and forward. 
I feed cats on campus. Uh, we have around 70 stray cats on campus and I feed about five of them. My favorite hobby, this sounds really nerdy, but I say it to all of my students. My favorite hobby is to listen to how other people think about math. And I think that that's one of my strengths as a teacher because rather than just me lecturing all the time, I always think, hey, what do you think about this? What's your estimate on this problem before solving? I make math explainer videos on TikTok. So um, I think that math just needs to be marketed better. Maybe they don't wanna watch a 20 minute YouTube video on something. Maybe they just need a quick one minute explainer. And that is my contribution to the math community. I believe I just want to give back to the math community. And I like making math memes as you saw in the previous slides. And that, that was probably like 1 20th of the memes that I've ever made. So if you really like those, just go to my website. You can find them all in categories um, and all of that. So my topic is honoring student thinking. If we truly believe that math is for everyone, we need to include student voices. And part of, part of my talk is how can we create an environment where students feel safe to share their thinking? So why is this topic important to me? Well, I strongly believe that student ideas are brilliant. Even if they are wrong, I still believe that they are brilliant. I think that math or education in general should foster curiosity and creativity. It's not just obtaining information, but where do we go from there? How are, how are we making students curious about something? It's like, hmm, well, what if this? If this is true, what can I do with this? And being a mathematician is much more than just following steps, such as I do, we do, you do. So in this talk, I'm going to split it into two sections. I'm going to first talk about low stake activities to help students feel comfortable sharing. And the second part is how to create a safe environment to share one's thinking. So first, low stake activities. So um, I know that a lot of you teach community colleges, if not everyone, um, I teach, uh, at a university, I teach uh, freshman to senior. So hopefully um, these ideas that I do with my students uh, can help um, at your school as well. So whether it's a lot of these are just warm up questions, uh, conversation starters. I really like going to new places and just taking pictures that I can bring back into the classroom. So. How many square tiles do you see? So not how many squares, but just how many of those square tiles? Can you type in the chat, how many square tiles do you see? Oh, thank you, Dan, for uh, dropping those links. So I see 25, I see 24. And can I hear three people unmute and tell me, how did you count? So many ways of counting. Can three people share? I started with the ones. I did the two ones, and then I did the two threes, and then I did the two fives, and the one in the middle. Okay, so you, um, so are you counting left to right to the center or up and down to the center? Oh, actually, I was doing up and down to the center. Ooh, okay, awesome. That's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I counted radial different. century. So I counted the six in the basically along one of the main lines and side areas multiplying by four and then adding one i'm sorry can you do that again so i know you said radial symmetry so like those top those top three and then the three that are off to the side so those three and then the three that are to the side of it above so along the diagonal the quarter like the first quadrant okay um and then multiplying that by four for the four rotations plus one in the center. That's awesome. So I really like that you talked about radial symmetry and then the one in the center. Thank you. Can I hear one more? I counted the middle column as six, then um, added 10 to represent the two columns next to that mm -hmm. and so forth, then six and then two. Great, awesome, thank you. So I posted this on TikTok as well. And there were a couple that mentioned something that I never saw. They said 25 because, well, I could just move this the ones on the left, like north, south, east, west, to just fill it in 
to make a five by five square. Do we all see that? So I never saw that. And someone said, well, I saw 25. So there has to be a square somewhere. And they just filled in the gaps. And Chris says, do we know for sure they are squares? I'm not sure, but, but yeah, thank you. All right, so how many squares, square tiles do you see and how did you count? Great way of just inviting students in. And I really like doing these types of things with the moral of, well, the beauty in math is found in the process, not the final answer. If we all just said 25 and I said, great, let's move on, we miss out on that beauty, like the radial symmetry or counting up to down or left to right um, or counting by um, someone saw like a three by three square in the middle and then three or four sets of three and then the ones, things like that. We miss out on that if we just focus on the final answer. Here's another one that I really like. The answer is 12. What's the question? Can you all type in the chat? What's a question where the answer is 12? What's a dozen? How many months are in a year? What is the square root of 144? What's six plus six? What is a factor of 48? Three times four, 24 divided by two. <laughs> what do you get when you switch the digit of the meaning of the digits of the meaning of life and divide by two? How many numbers are on a clock? Three squared plus three, what is the integral of dx from uh, two to 14? This is all great, thank you. <clears throat> How many people are in my family? I have. I am one of 10, awesome. So I think that this is a low stake activity. I think that it's also really fun and it shows how math can be creative where a lot of the times we just ask questions and they just give us answers. It's nice to just flip it around sometimes. and embrace the creativity that comes with math. So I posted this on TikTok where it's like, hey, how would you do 17 plus 18? And I got over 30,000 comments. And what's great, what, what wasn't great about this was that uh, people would say something like, oh, I did something really creative, but I'm weird like that or something like that. So I think to myself, well, what are we doing in school where, they have really creative ideas and then they kind of go back and say, well, I'm really weird or it's because I think differently or whatever. So that really makes me sad when uh, we think of math as just, it's a straight shot. You do this, you just stack 17 and 18 on top of each other at the ones place carry and then get the answer, right? Can you type in the chat? How would you do 17 plus 18? Ooh, I see 10 plus 10 plus 15, 15 plus 20, 40 minus five, seven plus eight plus 10 plus 10. Add two tens, then add 15. Great. And um, I got really excited because uh, the co-creator of Phineas and Ferv, uh, Dan Povenmire, commented his way of thinking. And I was like, wow, now I know how he thinks. And Hank Green stitched this video as well. So I'm like, wow, I know, I now know how Hank Green thinks. And going back to one of my title slides of one of my favorite hobbies is to listen to how other people think really makes me happy when people share um, their thinking. So thanks so much for that. <clears throat> Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing in the chat. So I think that math is a creative subject. I think that going through my bachelor's and master's, um, I think every single problem that I've ever done has more than one way of solving, right? And so I really think math is a creative subject. So it's like, hey, here's another way to think about it. One of the examples that I shared with my students in my second year of teaching, I will never forget. We were doing arithmetic sequences and I had students come up with the 100th term. So this is just one of the several that I gave them time to do. And in my head, this was my second year of teaching. In my head, 
I was thinking, okay, if they're finding the 100th term, I'm really hoping that they think of, okay, I'm starting at three, so I need to jump four 99 times to get the answer because it really lends itself to the arithmetic sequence formula, right? So that problem or that solution did come up and then a student raised his hand and he said, hey, I got the same final answer, but I did it a different way. So I said, okay, great. Can you come up to the board to share your process? And what he did, I will never forget. He wrote the multiples of four directly underneath. And he said, well, I noticed that all of these were one less than a multiple of four. So if we're looking for the 100th term, four times 100 is 400, subtract one to get 399. And my mind just exploded because I never saw arithmetic sequences like that. And what's great about this is that the arithmetic sequence formula of this specific sequence is 4n minus 1. And I couldn't believe that I never saw arithmetic sequences like that, where it's just constants away from multiples. Like 7n minus 2 is the multiples of 7 minus 2. And I can't believe that I never made that connection. So I'm very grateful that a student raised his hand and said, hey, I did it a different way. So, and I learn every day, something new every day um, from my students. And that is not an exaggeration. <clears throat> Chris says, another way term zero is negative one, add four times a hundred to it. Yep, great. And Abby says, it reminds me of the toothpick problem of building squares. Awesome. So just simply inviting students to say like, hey, what's another way to do this? Definitely opens up the realm of math. So overall, I always try to answer last because even though I might have a clever way of doing it, my goal as a teacher is not to boost my ego. That is not my goal at all. My goal is to build their inner mathematician. So that is why I always try to answer last because if they have something brilliant to say, let them say it rather than just me sharing like, oh, look how smart I am. Not the point of my job. <laughs> if I had one um, educational quote, I think that this would be it. My goal isn't to show off what I know. My goal is to bring out the best mathematician out of you. So when we honor student thinking, we do that. We say, hey, how do you think about it? Thank you, Linda. So we talked about lipstick activities. Now we are going to talk about how to create a safe environment to share one's thinking. Because I that is a very big hurdle. We can't just say, hey, what do you think? And then expect everyone to say, oh, oh, wow, this is such an inviting atmosphere. Let's talk about it. We really need to cultivate a safe environment together. So math class feels like a performance subject. So how do we make it okay to make mistakes? I think that students feel like once they've seen one example, they need to be proficient. They feel like they need to be proficient at it right afterwards. So how do we make it okay to make mistakes in the classroom? So I do constant group work. About 60% of my class is just students talking with each other. I have nine groups of four. They're always, um, and they're always facing each other. I don't have forward facing desks. So they brainstorm together and students could benefit from seeing thought process rather than the final product. So for example, I do a lot of think pair share where I give them time to think by themselves and then they share with a partner. But I think that it's important also to brainstorm together so they're not just seeing final processes all the or final products all the time. For example, like social media, I know that that really uh, hurts uh, mental health because they feel like everything someone does is perfect um, just because people choose to post their final product, you know, but we don't see all of the attempts of that. So it's nice to just brainstorm together saying like, okay, I tried this, it doesn't work. And then I tried this, I got closer, still doesn't work and all of that. So it's nice to just brainstorm together. And I do a lot of partner work saying person on the left, share your thinking process with the person on the right and vice versa. So it's not share your answer, it's share your thinking process, which allows them to say, well, at first I did this, 
but then it didn't work. Or, oh, I was wrong because blah. So, and as a whole class, I say, share your thought process rather than what's the answer or share your answer, just to invite them to say, well, at first I did this and all of that. And you might say, or you might think, but what if they are wrong, right? When students are gonna share their thinking, there are going to be wrong answers. So some things to think about, are they just answering a different question? Maybe they gave the integral rather than the derivative. You could say, that's great, you got the integral, what's the derivative? Or you got the perimeter, but what's the area? Is it true in certain cases? For example, huge misconception is just adding across fractions. You can say, well, that's true when you're maybe one day you're shooting three basketballs and you made two, and the next day you made one out of the four. So in total, you made three out of the seven. Those aren't fractions, but that's true in that case. And you could extend it to say, oh, that's a great extension of what would math look like if that was true? For example, what if you were to add across fractions? What are the consequences of that? I think that that would be a really fun side project. And it very well may be brilliant. Just because it's wrong doesn't mean that it can't be brilliant. Three years ago, no, four years ago, I had a student on a test. The question was, how do you know if two triangles are congruent? And this student wrote, two triangles are congruent if they have the same area and same perimeter. I want you to think about that for a second and type in the chat, do you think that that statement's true or false? This happened uh, four years ago, and I actually had to go, go on Twitter and ask because I'm like, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I actually gave them full credit because it took me about a week of thinking to convince myself that this is actually wrong, um, but it's still extremely brilliant, right? So, so yes, Chris says, my gut says false, but I have to explore or investigate. But yes, it would be a great exploration exercise. And like, I was thinking false because I never heard of it before, um, but I couldn't think of a counterexample until um, Christopher Danielson uh, showed me why it was wrong. But yeah. Oh, and Sunil says, think about Heron's formula. Awesome. So just because they are wrong doesn't mean that um, it's not brilliant. Now, I want us to spend five minutes reading this article. This article means a lot to me. I didn't write it, but um, I have all of my students write this or read this. So I want us to take five minutes to read this and read about the four types of mistakes. And Dan, if you want to just like cut this out the five minutes, just because it's just gonna be silent, but please read about the four types of mistakes. All right, so that is one of my favorite articles that I like sharing with my students. And we do it for test revisions as well, where they share the type of mistake that they made. Let's practice um, coming up with examples of each mistake. So um, if you can pick one of these and just share an example, a mathematical example of one in the chat, feel free to do so. So just pick one of these. What's an example of? High stakes mistake, sloppy mistake, aha moment mistake, stretch mistake. 
So two times three equals five. That's a sloppy mistake. Sloppy mistake with negative signs. Yep, three squared equals six. Oh, a stretch mistake is overgeneralizing a result. Ooh, okay. So if two squared equals four, then two cubed equals six. High stakes incorrectly calculating their grade. A stretch, try to find the derivative of 2x plus 3 all raised to the fifth before learning chain rule. Matthew asks, where would x plus y squared equals x squared plus y squared fit? I think it depends on where they're at in um, education. So if they already learned that, but uh, they made that mistake, I would think that it's a sloppy mistake versus if they're not there yet, they haven't learned it, I think that would be more of a stretch mistake. Great. Great, thank you so much for all of the examples. Um, I haven't heard an aha moment mistake yet, maybe I missed it, but an aha moment mistake, I think that that's the hardest one to think about. I think of those as epiphany mistakes, where um, when you're solving a problem and you know the answer, um, but you're like, oh, my process isn't working for some reason. For example, an aha moment mistake that I remember from high school is thinking that the zero product property works for numbers not equal to zero. For example, like x times y equals five. I remember thinking, oh, then that means x equals five or y equals five. Oh, but that doesn't really work as a solution when I plug it in. So I think that would be an example of an aha moment mistake when it's kind of an epiphany. So I like to connect this to reflections. So I do test revisions and at the end of the course. So I do at first I thought, but now I think for test revisions. And I do the sentence frame because I think that people in general um, have a really hard time uh, admitting that they're wrong right? They'd rather just stick with something that they said was true rather than just admit, hey, I was wrong. So this is just my way of showing that, hey, let's normalize changing our minds after learning new information. So at first I thought, but now I think I do this for test revisions and then they do the problem again. But I wanted to share a couple that I did for the end of the course. So at first I thought, that I would be never that I would never be good at math, but now I think I can actually be good at it. At first, I thought that in order to be good at math, I needed to instantly get all the answers right and not struggle. But now I think that in order for me to be good at math, I need to go through the process of making mistakes and learning from them. Can we practice this with our teaching practice? So think back to your first year of teaching or maybe even pre-service as well. You can say, at first I thought teaching was blah, 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 but now I think. So take some time, do that in the chat. So teaching addition style, at first I thought, but now I think. Yes, I was going to say something very similar to uh, what you are saying, um, what multiple people are saying right now. And these are very great realizations. I thought I could not make mistakes on the board. Now I think it's okay. I thought 
teaching was about math. Now I know it's about students. Very important. Assessment had to be the same for all my students, but now I think assessment can vary by student. Teaching would always be face-to-face, -face, but now I think it can change in ways I have not imagined yet. It was more about crafting good explanations. Now it's more about relationships. Yep. Yeah, what I was gonna share is at first I thought that being a good teacher meant just explaining concepts really well, but now I think it's more about, very similar to what Dan was saying, about uh, building on their thinking. I thought I had to have every problem solution prepped in advance. Now I feel like I can go through the process with the students. Yep. Thank you so much for sharing. So I really like doing this on test revisions rather just to really have them reflect. I think that there needs to be more reflection in notes. Um, so yeah. I always end. This is the last, actually, I lied. This is not the last slide. My last slide is always a meme of the day, but my second to last slide for every day is what did you learn today? What are you curious about? And I think that people just need to be more reflective in notes. Um, students not only just need to copy what's on the board, but put themselves into their notes. And like I said earlier on, education should be, should make you more curious about something rather than just answer getting, just information getting, it should lead you to something else. So what did you learn today? But more specific, more um, importantly, what are you curious about? So tell our students that education is driven by what ifs. Not only listen if they say something, but invite them in. Very important to foster their curiosity. So here are some ways to invite their thinking. Estimate before doing a problem. You can say, hey, what do you think the answer is? Share your thought process rather than what's the final answer. What's another way to solve this problem? Just to show that math is creative. Um, I really like saying what are some potential mistakes a hypothetical person can make just to not make it personal. What are you curious about? Like what I did on the last slide. What's an extension to this problem? Like if you're learning about Euclidean algorithm, say, can we do this for three numbers? And come up with your own word problem just to see what they talk about. I did um, come up with your own word problem for scientific notation and uh, I learned more about what, cele what celebrities they follow or what interests them. And that's always fun. And one tip that I catch myself doing a lot is not giving enough time for students to think. I give five minutes, but maybe they need six or seven. And I just like rushing saying like, okay, let's talk about it. But I need to constantly tell myself one of the best things that I can do as a teacher is give students time to think. So it's not just about giving them information, but giving them time to think. So, and it's also important to think about whose ideas are you honoring? Is it always the first person that talks? Is it always the students in the front? Is it like, we really need to think about our biases and make sure that our biases, um, we should eliminate those biases and our biases aren't in the way of making sure that everyone knows that they are a math person. So, I try my best to make math less of a performance subject. And I'm very big on being explicit with my students just because, uh, I don't know, I just like being upfront with them. So I say this about every week, especially when things get quiet, when I ask them a question. I say, it's okay to be wrong. I just want to know what you're thinking. And remember, we're on the same team. I say this about once a week, especially when I ask them like, hey, what's an estimation of this problem before doing it? And I'm very good with not giving in and uh, not just saying, okay, no one's talking, let's, let's do this problem. I am very good with not going on until um, someone says something. And just to kind of make them say something, I say these two things. 
right? So making math less of a performance subject by saying, it's okay to be wrong. I just want to know what you're thinking. Because when students are quiet, it can mean a couple things. It doesn't mean that they don't know it. I ask them, are you quiet because you need more time? You're too shy or you don't know the answer yet, right? And then they usually answer and say, okay, well, give you a couple more minutes or it's okay, just blurt out an answer. Let's just, um, let's uh, move on from there. Another thing that I do on the first day of school is called 20 words or phrases. Strongly recommend this. So when we're talking about honoring student thinking, it's not just mathematical. Um, we can also talk about the environment. So I tell them to talk with their group and share some words or phrases associated with math classes that they've had. Jennifer says, I like the word yet. Yes, I like that too. So I don't want to hear content words, but rather things like how the class was, what's a typical homework assignment, were you in rows, were you in groups, who was doing most of the talking, how was the teacher, throw in some emotional words, etc. So can we each write one word or phrase associated with a class that you've had in the past? You could throw in an emotional word, a typical homework assignment, a typical test. Enjoyable, false starts are important, boring, brave, lots of unfinished thoughts, exhausting, boring, rewarding, stimulating. Uplifting. Here was one class's um, 20 words or phrases from last semester. What do you notice or what do you wonder? What kinds of prizes? Yeah, I don't think I asked, a, I don't think I asked them what prizes, but I, as a kid, I totally remember a treasure box of, of stuff. <clears throat> what else do you notice or what else do you wonder? Competitive seems strange. Competitive how? Um, maybe time tests. I, I've had experiences where the teacher would put all of our grades in order of like highest to lowest, um, obviously with ID numbers, but still that it's okay to count with your fingers. Nothing positive is mentioned. It is normal that a math class is overwhelming and quiet. I think to myself, um, did we all have the same homework assignment? Because basically I've done this for about four years and every class would mention one to 31 odd. It's always those two numbers, not one to 29, one to 25. It's always one to 31 odd. So I ask them, do you want our class to be like this? They say either no, or I want to keep some of them. So what we do is I have them talk with their groups again, and I tell them to exchange words that they don't want for words that they do want. So for example, rather than number three, one to 31 odd, we can do um, optional homework. Or um, rather than embarrassment, number 19, we could say, um, like someone said, um, uplifting. Laurel said uplifting, right? Where we are all together. Exchange 16, not uh, competitive to collaborative. And then we keep exchanging until we get our ideal classroom. So that's one of my, that's the first activity that I do with my students on the first day of school. Strongly recommend it. And halfway through the semester, I ask them, what am I doing well and what can I improve on? 
couple years ago, students would say that I encourage multiple ways of thinking. That's great. I show a lot of visuals. They like the group work. It, it feels like a safe environment. But what can I improve on? Um, they did mention in the first couple of years that I go too quickly. And throughout the years, I get fewer of those comments now, which makes me super happy because that means that I'm improving. And they also want optional homework. I don't give mandatory homework. I have read um, articles saying that homework um, is not fair. So, cause you don't know their home life. So I do no homework, but they're like, we kind of want some practice. So can we get optional homework? So I'm like, okay, here you go, if you want it. So just asking them halfway through the semester, hey, what am I doing well? What can I improve on to honor their thinking? and to show that we are all on the same team. And when we honor student thinking, they will see that they are a math person. I made this frame uh, three years ago and it only costs less than $10 and I like to just use it every single semester. On the first day of school, when they leave, I tell them to grab their phones, take a picture with this frame, don't do anything with it until um, I tell you um, some other time to bring it up. And one of the very last assignments that I give them is a reflection. I'm a math person reflection where on Google Slides, they put their name, they put that picture that they post, that they took, a, that I took a picture of um, on the left, and they answer this paragraph. I'm a math person because, or I have grown in my mathematical abilities this semester by, and this is a collaborative Google Slide so they can all see each other's um, work. And we, if you are working at a community college, you know that we don't really have yearbooks or anything. So this is just my way of having like a fake yearbook. So I can say, oh yeah, you were uh, in spring 2018 or whatever. So it's just nice to see all of them um, on a collaborative Google slide. So part of it is selfish reasons where it's nice to just see everyone in one place, kind of like a yearbook. Um, but also it's nice to just reflect on how they have grown in just five months. So here is one student's response. I'm not going to read everything. Um, but at the beginning, she wrote, I am a math person because I have really enjoyed how to, in I have learned, really learned how to enjoy math and realize just how fun it can be to learn. It doesn't mean that I always get the answer right, but rather that I can enjoy the process of learning how to get there. And towards the end, Math is a subject that can branch out into so many new and creative ways of doing and approaching it, which is exactly why anyone and everyone can be a math person. So you, you get those reflections and it's really nice to just hear um, how much of an impact you have made in just four to five months. So overall, my goal as a teacher is to build on their existing mathematical thinking, which requires listening to their ideas. And you need to believe that all students have brilliant ideas because they do. And in general, how are we building their curiosity and creativity? And lastly, math is much more fun when we all share our thinking. So I want you to grab your phones and text yourself one thing that you will take from the session just to make things actionable. Maybe you really like my memes. I know that Dan already posted my website um, in the chat. Feel free to use them. Students really appreciate the memes. Maybe you like the 20 words or phrases. Maybe you wanna make that frame. Maybe it's the uh, conversation starters of how many squares are there. But I don't know about any of you, I text myself about 10 to 15 times a day just because I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. And then I just text myself just so I don't forget. So I don't know if anyone else does that, but um, I do that 10 to 15 times a day just so I don't forget things. Oh yeah, the article on mistakes, Laura, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, 
if you want to share what resonated with you, feel free to do so um, in the chat. And I know that I needed to stop at um, 1.55 your time. So I want to thank you all so much. Please contact me. Um, I share uh, my math videos on Twitter. I share math memes almost every day on Twitter. Um, I like sharing teaching ideas. You can find uh, all of my TikTok videos, all of my memes by category at howiewa.com or you could just email me. But thank you so much um, for spending time with me. It really means a lot. And thank you so much to Dan for inviting me here.